Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Badi. And I want to thank the Muvatin Institute for Democracy and Human Rights for the kind invitation and my colleagues, Professor Mudar Kassis and Joyce Kashu for the assistance with this. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Uh, basically, what I'm going to talk about uh, this evening uh, in the next 20 minutes, give or take, is how uh, the Palestinian Authority has used the two permanent international courts, the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, to uh, increase the level of protection for the Palestinian people, uh, to bring those claims at the international level and to... Um, I'm also going to mention a little bit the procedures, the interstate case between Palestine and Israel before the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So I think that international law has played an important role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for a very long time. And it has played probably an even more important role in the last 20, 20 years or so. And there are many reasons why the state of Palestine resorted increasingly to international law. Uh, and I think probably there are three main reasons. One is the symmetry of power. On the one hand, uh, a state that um, is curtailed in what it can do because uh, Israel occupies most of its territory. The second is using international law to draw more attention to the serious violations of international law. And the third, I think, is to ensure broad international support. Now, there have been, there are at least five cases uh, before the International Court of Justice, two advisory opinions that have been rendered, and three contentious cases that are ongoing, one brought by Palestine itself, which relates to the movement of the US embassy to Jerusalem, and the other two concern the case brought by South Africa against Israel about the situation in Gaza, and the other one was brought by Nicaragua against Germany. And I think this last case is very important in terms of legal obligations of third states with regard to the conflict in Gaza, and actually more generally concerning the occupied Palestinian territory. I will also try to address uh, the procedures before the International Criminal Court and give a little bit of the background. And also, I think it's important to highlight some of the double standards that have been following the Palestine situation before the ICC. What are the issues that have been raised? I think that's uh, relate very much and reflect the situation in Palestine, the prolonged military occupation and the legal consequences of the right to self-determination uh, that is two important issues for the ICJ and international crimes committed uh, before the ICC. Um, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and in fact, uh, genocide. Now we have probably uh, persons that um, are not maybe well versed in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, that might be following this on YouTube. I'm not going to give here a full historical account of the conflict, but it is important to know that there have been international efforts made to resolve, but in the last decade, maybe a little bit more, the peace process has been defunct and there has been a strong opposition by Israel to engage and there have been several adverse developments, especially during the Trump administration, with recognition by the US of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and a lot of pressure put on the Palestinian Authority. When it comes to the engagement of the Palestinian Authority with international law, there are at least two stages that we can distinguish. One starting in 1989 with the efforts by Palestine to join UNESCO World Health Organization, which were vehemently opposed by the US, threatening basically to pull the plug on these institutions. Um, and then uh, more successful efforts from 2009 onwards with the Palestine joining a lot of the human rights treaties, main core uh, UN human rights treaties, 
but also a lot of international organizations and the strengthening of its status at the United Nations. I put this here as well, um, maybe for a very simple reason that to see what has happened over time from the UN partition plan in 1947 with an allocation of territory, let's say about 45 to 55, 45 for uh, Palestinians to Trump's peace plan um, in whereby that territory is reduced only 15% of historic Palestine. I think that's also part of why I think um, the situation with annexation of territory that has continued over time has also pushed um, the Palestinian Authority to take these steps. With regard to Palestine and the ICC, if you look at the Palestine situation at the ICC, it seems like everything started in 2015, but that is not the case because the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Center for Human Rights tried to bring these issues before that to, to the attention of the ICC already in 2009. And the first ICC prosecutor rejected these efforts in April 2013, so almost three years later, later with, I think, a two, three-page uh, document that was heavily criticized by many international criminal law scholars. But Palestine didn't give up, so it became a state party to the ICC uh, in 2015. And then, despite the fact that the situation in Palestine has been closely followed, the crimes have been well documented, at least since 2008, but even earlier, it took four and a half years after Palestine became an ICC member state for the second ICC prosecutor to announce that the statutory criteria for the open investigation had been met. And then 2021, uh, the prosecutor announced the opening of the investigation, the situation in the state of Palestine, which actually uh, the investigation of Afghanistan and also of the situation in Palestine resulted in the high officials of the ICC to be sanctioned by the US. So just to sum up uh, a little bit this history uh, of delays, if I can call it that, the Palestine situation has been pending before the ICC for over 15 years. If we take into account here also the proper motor powers of the Office of the Prosecutor. And then finally, the third ICC prosecutor filed applications for warrants of arrest for three uh, high officials of Hamas and for two high officials from Israel, Netanyahu and Gallant, and more than five months later, there are no arrest warrants issued yet. And if I compare this with the situation in Ukraine, it took about three months for the arrest warrants against the Russian president to be uh, acknowledged and uh, by the pretrial chamber. And overall, I think an, an, an average, uh, if I'm not mistaken here, that has been by looking at all of these uh, procedures is that it hasn't taken more than about a month, a month and a half for these arrest warrants to be issued generally. Something else that also should uh, we should draw attention to in terms of, of who is supporting and then the, 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 the division, if you want, between the global north and the global south in terms of support. We have uh, a number of countries referring the situation to the, to the ICC. Legally, it doesn't necessarily mean so much because the situation is before the ICC, but I think it matters when one thinks a little bit more about the signals that this sends to the court uh, operating on a zero growth budget and having so many situations before it where to spend that money. So I think that is quite uh, problematic. Uh, then we also know about the intense pressure on the ICC to drop the investigations on the Palestine situation, especially by the US authorities, the interference, pressure by Israeli authorities. Uh, so uh, this is quite problematic, I think, in terms of if one thinks about 
uh, the ICC being there to investigate and prosecute mass atrocity crimes wherever they are committed uh, when it concerns persons that have the citizenship, the nationality of the ICC state parties, this is quite problematic. And also very problematic is that there's still no access to Gaza for the ICC. Um, I think I'll skip this, but just to note that a lot of persons, when they speak about Gaza, it seems that their clock starts from the 7th of October, 2023, um, which indeed um, was a tragic uh, event with uh, brutal attacks, which resulted in the killing of uh, about 1,200 Israelis. But if we just look here at the numbers and the, the situation, we have armed conflicts there in 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2018, 2019, 2021, and then now more recently. And if you just look at the numbers of the persons killed here, I think it is quite clear that there is no sense of proportionality in the military operations carried out by the IDF. And now we're moving over 43,000 Palestinians uh, killed and over 100,000 injured. And a lot of these uh, individuals are women and children. And I have to make another note here that uh, the fact that the rest is men doesn't make them military targets or also uh, doesn't mean that they are lawful uh, targets. So now moving on to the ICJ and trying to keep an eye on the time, but I hope you can give me a little nod. Um, five uh, recent cases from 2003 to now. So it's it, it's a span of about two decades, uh, lots of cases. I think probably there hasn't been any other situation that uh, has attracted so many uh, or has so many cases brought before the, before the ICJ because we don't have only these three cases, uh, sorry, five cases, but we also have two related historical advisory opinions uh, which relate actually to the situation in Palestine. Um, we see here that many states have participated in these advisory opinions. Uh, as you can see here in the numbers, uh, we have 40, 50 states that have participated. Um, we have the EU participation in the first uh, advisory opinion of 2004, no EU participation in 2024. But I think here we have to note the states that supported Palestine in pointing out the unlawful policies of annexation, uh, settle, illegal settlements, violations of civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights of Palestinians because the wall on the associated regime and the prolonged Israeli occupation, 57 years at least. Um, but what should be noted as well is that a number of states, especially from the global south, they were trying to push uh, Palestine on these matters and they were trying to push the court to uh, saying that these procedures before the ICJ are not going to help the uh, peace process. And while probably in the first advisory opinion, there might have been some semblance of a peace process ongoing. The second time, there was nothing actually along those lines. So this was uh, this was a very problematic position to take by many countries. If we look at the South Africa versus Israel again, and to compare with uh, another genocide case, or the two other genocide cases, we see here that we have 10 states that are joining here, South, the case South Africa versus Israel. And with the exception of Spain, we have no other EU countries. Whereas the case brought by Ukraine versus the Russian Federation, there we have a long list of uh, states from the EU and NATO joining. Uh, again, quite a clear, a clear um, problematic position, I think, on, on the part of those countries. 
finally, um, before I move on to obligations for third, for third uh, states that have been uh, taken up um, by both advisory opinions, when Nicaragua brought the case against Germany, I think probably uh, there was some derision by the part of our, our sub countries uh, trying to speak about Nicaragua's own human rights um, record uh, in order to, if you want, um, cast some some shadows on on the standing the position of Nicaragua to bring a case against Germany. Uh, but that bringing of the case resulted at least initially in uh, Germany taking some steps to limit the military aid given to uh, to Israel, although that seems to be moving a little bit back and forth. Something to point out on both advisory opinions uh, is that judges have been quite... Um, the overwhelming majority of the judges have stated very clearly that the wall and society regime is contrary to international law. Israel should dismantle it, the wall and the structure uh, and the associated regime, make reparations uh, for all damage that has been caused, for all the states not to recognize the legal situation, not to render aid or assistance, and uh, for uh, ensuring compliance by Israel with IHL as embodied in the Geneva Convention 4. Um, I have to say here that there has been enough condemnations, but no sanctions against Israel by the US, EU and individual countries. So that has been quite problematic. And the advisory opinion of July 2024, again, addressed to Israel, all states, international organizations, and especially the UN and the General Assembly, which has been followed up by the General Assembly resolution in September. It's quite important because it's, it speaks or it outlines a little bit in more detail these obligations. And the most important part here is that it asks Israel to bring its unlawful presence in occupied, occupied Palestinian territory to an end as rapidly as possible, with the General Assembly saying that that has to be within one year. So to conclude um, very quickly, international law is very important, although um, I think it's a bit difficult to be too upbeat about international law when we see the situation and the flagrant breaches by Israel uh, and the lack of real sanctions on the part of states. But also I think we have to see that the situation is changing with a number of countries, with Spain, Ireland, Belgium, Norway, other countries uh, taking concrete steps uh, to, to try to put more pressure on Israel, including through potential sanctions and, and uh, in any event, uh, trying to, to stop um, or not to provide support for the maintenance of this uh, situation. Palestine has tried to use international law to bolster its claim, uh, also due to the asymmetry of power. International law can serve as a guidance to resolve the, or to, to bring about a just solution to the long uh, conflict. And also the ICC will play an important role to ensure individual criminal responsibility despite the delays. I think there are three immediate imperatives regarding Palestine, ceasefire and humanitarian assistance to Gaza, uh, the release of Israeli hostages and arbitrarily detained Palestinians, uh, and the end of the Israeli occupation and respect for self-determination of the Palestinian people. And I think here, all of these uh, advisory opinions and the cases before the ICJ and the ICC are going to play an important role. Thank you.